Also, at this time, the pastor will come forward and give us a message on redemption history and our individual eschatology. And, uh, good morning, church. Good to see you in the house of God this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Today, I'm going to begin a, a several parts message, kind of on theme with the Mother Church and the books of redemption history. Predominantly, the message I'm speaking today will be coming out of Book 8 of Redemption History. And by the way, I would encourage all of you to begin to read those books and to study them and really discern and <coughs> seek wisdom from all of them. Today is only just a little part of that message, but I pray that it would be a time of awakening for you, be a time of great blessing. When we talk about the word eschatology, it's not a medical term, it's not some great theological term or it's, it's intended to confuse us, but it's, uh, it is a term that theologians have come up with that talks about the end time. And when you think about the end time, you think about great tribulations and stuff coming upon a world, wars, great tribulations, great earthquakes, dropping of nuclear weapons. We think of all these kinds of things. Today we can really consider that and think about it too, but what I would rather you think about it, what God would rather you think about. Don't think about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and great dividing and splitting of the earth and all these kinds of things. And I don't want you to be ignorant or stupid anymore about heaven, the house, the mansions that God has created and promised to bless us with in the last days. How do you believe that God is alive and God cannot lie? Amen. Amen. How many believe that God's word, when he sends it out, whether he sends it out by a prophet, a priest, or whether he sends it out through his church or you and I, the Bible says whatever he sends out, it will never come back to him empty or void without fulfilling his will. May the will of God be fulfilled in this church and through you and I, in our Father's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, or excuse me, not tonight, Don got me on that roll. <laughs> Today, let's talk about eschatology. Look at your neighbor and say eschatology. Eschatology. What is eschatology? Well, we're going to learn about there's a worldly eschatology. We're going to learn there's an individual and a spiritual eschatology. Okay? Eschatology concerns death. That's why I had you read the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. It says, I'll fear no evil. Did you know God never even intended us to fear death? I'll fear no evil because thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me and they're with me. I perish the table before me in the present body. Let me tell you, when you're dead, you don't eat nothing. Why would you worry about eating if you're dead? We need to really be listening to what I'm sharing with you this morning. If you love God, open them ears, that heart, and receive the word of God. Amen? Amen? In eschatology, individual eschatology, there's death. Then there comes man's intermediate state. Not to be confused with Catholicism. Don't be thinking about a place called purgatory. Because where we go is either heaven or hell. And then we're going to talk about the resurrection or the transfiguration. And we're going to talk about judgment. Now, a lot of churches preach that there is no judgment on believers. Let me tell you something. That is a lie right out of hell. The Bible says we are judged. Some are judged already because they reject the Son, Jesus Christ. But it says that we will be judged according to our deeds. Look at your neighbor and say, according to my deeds. Whether good or bad, let me tell you, we're not son of a guns. Amen? There is no wicked people that can do good. Everything we do that's called good by God is done according to the will of God, the word of God, and the last will and testament of God of God our Father. Hallelujah! So biblical eschatology is a deep field. It's a deep word. 
It's a field of study that's going to encompass far more than merely thinking of some kind of a worldly end, a worldly catastrophic end, about end time events. All of these things the church customarily speaks about. But what we're going to talk about is understanding end time prophecy. What is eschatology? It is understanding. That's what it is. God wants to give us understanding of his word and end time prophecy. Included within the discipline, if we would call it that, the discipline or of eschatology, we're going to find there's an eternal destiny for every individual. How many of you believe that? There is no middle ground, church. When we look at Luke <coughs> chapter 16, verses 19 through 21, we find out there was a rich man and we find out there was a beggar. And we see immediately, say that with me, immediately, immediately. the rich man was in the grave and yet he says he was in hell and there he was tormented. There he was thirsty. There he knew everything. He knew that he was separated from God and that it was not just a temporary separation. It was an eternal separation. And he said, God, send somebody to help me. And God said, I can't send nobody to you now. You haven't believed Moses. You haven't believed the prophets. He said, I bet you you won't even believe someone even though he rises from the dead. If you love the Lord, you have to know Jesus rose from the dead. Give Amen. God glory in the house of God this morning. Amen. So what I want to talk about today is there is a there is two states that we can be in. We're either the Bible says that old poor man, he didn't have nothing. He didn't have anything to eat. It seemed like God had abandoned him. But let me tell you something. When he died, say that with me. When he died, brothers, he was rejoicing in heaven. He was rich. So we don't need to be worried about worldly tribulations. Sometimes the church goes through darkness. Sometimes the church goes through <coughs> tribulation. Sometimes the church goes through hard times. Sometimes the church, like that old ark of Noah, is tossed about by the seas. But remember one thing, church. Remember one thing, people of God. God is in control of the ship. Hallelujah. Sometimes he's not in control, it's because we're trying to control it. No matter how well you can paddle, how smart you are, you can't control the ship in the last days. This old pastor's learning that even as in this church, through you guys. So today I want to talk to you about the discipline of eschatology and your eternal destiny. Let me tell you something, you've got a destiny and it's eternal. It's eternal. It's eternal. The Bible says our eternal destiny, that of the individual, is often conceived in four phases. Four phases of life, four phases of our eternal destiny. Number one, you ought to be writing this stuff down. Number one, our first phase is a physical death. God never intended us to die, but we die. Why? Because of the fall of Adam. The second phase is called the intermediate state. When we die, it's not over. Are you listening this morning, church? When you die, it's not over. Number three, there comes a bodily resurrection or the transfiguration. And then that fourth phase is called the judgment, not of just the unbeliever but also the believers. I mean, have you ever heard of something called in Greek called the Bema Judgment? <coughs> That's a good judgment because it's not where believers like you and me are cursed. It's not where we lose our salvation. It's where God says, take off that little crown, old boy and girl, and I'm going to reward you according to what you've done. That's why we ought to be encouraged this morning and start doing wonderful stuff on this side for God. That's why we do it. Not for man's recognition, but for God's. Think about it for a minute. Senior pastor used to talk about how women put on makeup to look beautiful. 
And he said, are you putting on that makeup for God or for man? Most times women are putting on beautiful makeup so they can impress the woman next to them. Or they can find them a man. Don't come to church to find a man. Come to church to find the man. Hallelujah. Amen. Find God. So, what are those states? Number one, what was it? Physical, Physical death. death. Number two, what was it? The intermediate state. Number three, what was it? The bodily, the bodily resurrection or transfiguration. Number four, what was it? Judgment. Judgment of the believer or the unbeliever. So the subject today of this message and the word that I'm trying to share with you is coming right out of the Bible. From 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Let me tell you something. Paul saw the third heaven and he knew what he was talking about. My father knows what he's talking about when he wrote the Bible and when he inspired the Bible, even when he inspired the books of redemption history. You better believe that. So let me ask you a question. You say, Pastor, why do I need to know about all this eschatology? That sounds like some confounding word. There's nothing confounding about it when you read redemption history because it begins to open it up. Hallelujah. Eschatology, four points I want you to remember there. Number one, how does our awareness of what the Bible and our Father says about eschatology, how does it affect the way we live, the way we share God's word, and the way we worship? Eschatology, if we under it, it ought to affect something. It ought to affect the way covenant of the torch people worship in the house of God. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it ought to affect something. It ought to affect me. <coughs> Number two, why should a f eschatology affect the way we worship? Eschatology, if you understand it. How many believe God wants us to understand eschatology? How many believe that God wanted Israel to believe the prophets? Especially the true prophets. How many believe you need to understand prophecy? It's all about, prophecy is all about eschatology. Prophecy tells us there's much more in the law, much more in the New Testament, much more in the revelation that you and I need to understand. And when you understand it, it will change the way this little church worships God. Hallelujah! We all talk about we're going to go to heaven. We all think we're going to have these mansions in heaven. We all think there are going to be golden mansions in heaven. I heard a minister the other day on the internet. He was lying, I think. I'm not sure. I won't judge him. I'll let God judge you. He talked about how his, one of his pastors under him saw heaven. Witnessed heaven, and in life he had an ugly wife. He said, but when he got to heaven, she was beautiful. He didn't recognize her. He wanted to stay there. She was so beautiful. He said, no. She, his wife told him, no, you've got to go back to earth. Your life's not over. So he left heaven. He always wanted a beautiful wife, and he had to leave her there. She was with God. How many of you want to be beautiful in these last days? Don't put on makeup, put on the Word of God. Hallelujah! Amen. Number three, what is the relationship between us, between God, between eschatology and the Word? What is the relationship between worship and the mission this church has? See, the church has a mission. But that means individually, each and every one of us, we have a mission. What do you do? We send it out. Do you believe you've got a mission? We have a mission. Debanjet, number four. Why is it important that we have a clear understanding about eschatology? Somebody might say, well, I don't need to understand, Pastor. That's for pastors. No, it's for you. Hallelujah. Even Revelation was written for you. Amen. The prophets were sent for you. Jesus died for you. Our Father sent prophets and prophets and revelation and he gave the word of God. Books of redemption history are for you. Not for somebody else, they're for you. Can you say amen in the house? Amen. amen. <clears throat> With that understanding, that, that great word, I want to talk about some very important things. Turn in your Bibles 
I'm not going to let time get away from me and bore you, but I believe if you're a true child of God, you won't be bored this morning because you're going to want to know more and more and more. Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 38, verses 17 through 20. Job 38, verses 17 through 20. Job. What verse did I say? 17 through 20. 38, 17 through 20. Now this is going to get deep on you. Don't just read about this as some Old Testament boring thing. You better get blessed and you better have them ears open right now. Job chapter 38. Verses 17 through 20. How many of you are willing to read the word of God with me this morning? Amen. Let's read it. Let's read from verse 16. Shemuk Yosef at all. It says, Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Now we have to know what the sea and the deep is here. Verse 17. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Let me tell you something. Death is a gate. <coughs> and I'll say that again. Even death is a gate. And there are several kinds of death. We need to understand which one is the right gate. Hallelujah. There's a wrong gate. There's a right gate. There's a narrow gate. There's a broad gate. We need to enter the right gate. I pray somebody don't get blessed by this. Let's read 17 again. Jesus, huh? have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? See, death can also be what? Deep darkness. It can also be great light. Won't you? I'll add that later. Verse 18 says, have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Verse 19 Begin, where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? Verse 20, that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home. I don't know about you, but my home is not death. My home is life and in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. This is deep. You better chew on this one for a while. This is better than... Sir Owen Steak, receive the word of God and be blessed. <clears throat> Big number one. What is physical death? As I said, death is also a gate and a way. Now you've got to really be listening to me or you're going to get confused. Little number one, death in the Bible, even the word for death, is used to describe three different experiences and three paths. Death is describes, it describes three gates, three ways, three paths. Number one, little number one, there is a spiritual death. What is spiritual death? What is spiritual death? That means you just stop coming to church or something? Now you think that's spiritual death? Now you can be in church and be dead. Come on, somebody say amen this morning. Amen. I ain't being negative, I'm telling you the truth. <coughs> Spiritual death is the separation and the alienation of our individual soul from God. The way God th wants things is, is for us to be like Adam in the Garden of Eden. The way God wants things to be done on this earth, the way God wants us to dwell, the way God wants us to live, is to live in his image and likeness. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. That's the way heaven is. That's the way paradise ought to be. Paul saw that. So Paul would write these things. Our father wrote about them. He expounded on them. He explained them. And somebody's going to get blessed when they read about them. Amen? I mean, we wish that book eight was in English. Amen. <laughs> I wish it was too. Let's just believe it's coming. Amen. 
Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 says when Adam eats of the wrong tree. He said, Adam, the day when you eat of that tree, you're going to die. What kind of death was that? He didn't die that day, but he did die that day. What kind of a death? He took the wrong gate. Say that with me. He took the wrong gate, the wrong path. <coughs> we need to go the path to the tree of life. The second verse I want you to write down is Genesis chapter 3, verse 3. When he ate of it, he was not only afraid of death, now he was afraid of God. He was confused. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, tells us he went into hiding and he was naked. Man, you need to understand what it means to be afraid of God. You need to understand what it means to be naked. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 5. When am I going to read all this? We'll do it in Bible studies later. But you need to write it down now. Read your Bibles. I'll say it one more time. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So the first death was what? Spiritual death. Every time there's a spiritual death, we're separated from God. But pastor, I still go to church. You're still separated from God. You worship Him, but you worship Him on the wrong mountain. You're living your life, but you're living the wrong life. You're on a journey, but you're on the wrong way. You're on a journey, but you're trying to go to the wrong gate. <coughs> I don't know, but I, I feel like Jimmy Swagger this morning. I want to just start jumping around moving somewhere. Because I'd love to see you move. The second one is eternal death. It's also called the second death. When we're separated from God in spiritual death, if we don't change our path, there is a second death. That's for the wicked. The wicked can never do good. They may think they're doing good. You see, do you ever thought about why God called Israel, the chosen children of God, wicked? Why did Jesus call the Pharisees and Sadducees, you wicked brood of servants, you wicked generation? You know something? This church and this people here, in the world we're in today, the church we're in today, the world's church can be in darkness and chaos. And they can be doing wicked things when they think they're doing good. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus said in the last days, many of you say to me, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. That means they were using his name. They were doing things. But God's going to say, I don't know you. Because your works are evil. You're a worker of iniquity. When Jacob was dying, the Bible says he was handed down the word. He handed down the promise of the covenant of the <coughs> But he had only really one son who truly believed, who was willing to endure everything to take that word, to take his brothers, to take his brothers and sisters, to give them hope. He said, bury me in Canaan. I believe in the covenant of the torch. Hallelujah. That's why Jacob could pull up his feet in his bed. And Jacob died. But he died a glorious death. He took the right gate the right way. For he had chosen the right God. Have you chosen the right God this morning? There is a right God. So let's, let's read about that for a minute. Just write them down. The second death is called the culmination of all eternal things. There is, it is the continuation of not just a temporary death. See, if you're dead, say that with me. If I'm dead, Jesus can make me alive. If I'm dead, God can fill me with his word and his Holy Spirit and he can make me alive. Revelations chapter 2 verse 11 is not a lie. Revelations chapter 20 verse 6 is not a lie. Verse 14 is not a lie. Revelations 14, excuse me, Revelations 21, verse 8, they all talk about this second death. <coughs> Listen, church, God does not want us to have any part in the second death. You might die in the flesh, but God doesn't want you to die at the second death. Because you will be like that old rich man. Let me ask you a question, church. If we were rich, like that man in Luke 16, verse 19, if we were rich 
If we saved all of our money, we saved everything, we owned lands and houses and cars and had children and the cattle on a thousand hills, we could be rich in this world, but if we don't, if we die the second death, we're eternally separated from God. Do you want to be eternally separated from God? We need to be careful on how we worship God, how we serve God, how we love God. Let me tell you something. Coming to church is not worshiping God. Coming to a building is not worshiping God. You don't come into a building and receive the Holy Ghost. You've got to come to the Word of God. Somebody shout amen in the house. Amen. amen. Third, the third death I'm going to talk about is a physical death, but it's only a temporary separation from your church, from your loved ones, from your family. We had an elder's son that passed away this past Thursday in Orlando. He passed away, but he served the Lord with all of his heart, his mind, and his soul. He even took the senior pastor's writings and he, he took a song and changed it. The day he died, they had practiced that song. That afternoon, listen church, you better listen to me, please. That afternoon, as close as that family was to God, for just a moment, the elder, this young man who would die that day, who loved God with all of his heart. They decided it was time the children had to go back to school. And they went out to the sea. They was going to have fun on the beach for just an afternoon. He had been to church that morning. But that day, the riptide, though he was only in shallow water, grabbed him. And Brother Pastor Beatty told me about what it's like to be caught in a riptide. Have you ever been caught in a riptide? It snatched him out. And we were all tall, and I'm sure he was a, probably a pretty good swimmer. You don't swim against the current. You swim with the current or parallel to the beach until you get out of the riptide. But Pastor Beatty himself said, Pastor John, that happened to me one time. I didn't know what was up. I didn't know what was down. I didn't know what was right. I didn't know what was left. I was being tumbled and drug out to sea. Let me tell you something. This world has riptides in it, too. And even you may think, well, I'm going to go to the beach this afternoon. I believe his was for good. But if you're not careful, your death, the devil can mean for evil. You may just say for a moment, I'm going to go to the beach. You know, there's a lot of people that went to the beach today instead of coming to the house of God. This deacon never met. He never missed a worship service. He never forsook the house of God. But now he's physically dead. But you know something? I'm going to bring some good news to you here. His death did not separate him from God. His death brought him closer to God. You need to get right with God this morning, church. People by VOD, you need to get right with God. We all, this pastor, we all need to get right with God. There's a lot of getting we need to do. We put everything before God. I don't care how much money you make in this world. Don't let it become your God. I don't care how many family members you got in Tampa, here or there, or there, wherever. Don't put your family before you do worshiping God. Can I shout amen this morning? Do you want to be eternally separated from God? I can't separate you, but God's word will. <coughs> See, this is not Pastor John's word. This is God's word. Amen? Yeah. You don't have to like it, but you better believe it. Death is a gate. Listen carefully. Physical death is a temporary separation of the material and immaterial aspects of our very human constitution. We are made up of something. When we die of physical, de physical death, something is separated. Do you know what it is? If you know God, your spirit and your soul may be divided. 
from your body. But they are instantly, say that with me, they are instantly, in the twinkling of an eye, they are in the presence of God. See, right now we're living in the presence of God by the word and by faith. But the word of God and the spirit of God, if you really believe God, if you're really worshiping God this morning, God sees you. You might not see him, but by faith you're worshiping him. Hallelujah. Amen. That's real. <clears throat> Physical death is only a temporary separation of our human constitution. I'll, I'll just give you some verses here. Write them down. You read it and ponder this. Genesis chapter 35, verse 18. James chapter 2, verse 26. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 24. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 58. Listen carefully. Paul speaks of a bad death, but Paul also speaks of a good death. What? You mean, Pastor John, there can be a good death? Yes. God's in control. He's not going to transfigure everybody before his time comes. And God's not going to take you to heaven if he still has a work for you to do. How many believe you still got a work that God wants you to do in this world? Amen. Well, I'm not a very good. I can't, I can't pay. I, 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 hear that I? Yeah, you can't do anything, but the Spirit of God can enable you to do everything. Amen? Amen. So I want you to think about that. Paul speaks of a good death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. So in far, as far as we're going to study the terms about the destiny of Christian individuals, I want you to know there are those who have been saved because they're spiritually alive. Are you spiritually alive this morning? There are those that have been spiritually, that have spiritually died. Not coming to church is a good example of that. But like I said, the building and a cross. And, and, and let me tell you, did you come here today to please Pastor John? Did you come here today simply because, oh, uh, Pastor John's going to see I'm here, or Elder so and is going to see me, or Pastor Beatty's going to see me do this? You didn't come here to please man. You came here to please God. Amen? Stop putting on worldly makeup. Put on the makeup and the garments God wants you to put on. It's called the word of a living God. Hallelujah. So I want you to think about it. Our study is going to concern the destiny of every Christian. Every individual Christian. Those who have been saved from an eternal spiritual death and we'll focus on these three physical these three spiritual or these three eternal deaths or, or eternal life death is a gate look at your neighbor and say death is a gate I want to talk about this afternoon what causes death but you know what my God Father's word is so good, church. You could be, you could skip out on a beach trip this afternoon. You could skip out on a party. You could skip out on a barbecue. You could skip out on these back to school things and be back in the house of God and study the word of God this afternoon. Amen. You might do a lot of things, but the greatest thing you can do is be in the house of God and study the word this afternoon. We are going to open up some things you've never heard in your life. You've been confused about it. Well, they say, she says, I've heard. I want you to get out of the... Let me tell you something. You're living in some kind of a world right now. You hear me? Every one of you in here are living in some kind of a world. I believe President Obama's living in his world. I believe you're living in your world. And I know God wants us to live. He says, you're living in a world. But where is your world going to end up? Will it be a world that's destroyed, eternally separated from God? That can never be heaven. Or is your world going to be in the Word of God, in heaven, 
So I'm going to talk about your world, and at 1 o'clock I'm going to talk about your home in heaven, your house in heaven. How many believe you've got a house in heaven? Amen. Let me tell you something. Stop thinking about it's light years out there somewhere. The only reason it's light years out there is you're light years away from understanding the Word of God. Where is heaven? It's right here if you have the Word of God. Right here. Well, Pastor, it don't feel like heaven. That's your fault, not God's fault. Do you have joy in the Lord this morning? You can. God wants you to. But you need to understand the Word and eschatology. Stop worrying about what this world is going to end up at. Start thinking about what your world is going to be. Don't live in a fairy tale world. Live in the world that God wants you to live. Amen? Did I scare you when I shouted? The only reason I do it is because sometimes I see some of you bowing that neck. I don't know if you're praying or sleeping. <laughs> I'm not being mean and rude. I'm just trying to wake you up. Do I offend you when I raise my voice? Do I offend you when I preach the truth? Does the word of God offend you? That's not my fault. That's your fault. Somebody say amen in the house. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you told us through that old woman who'd been married so many times, Father. John 4, 24. That one day... The children of Israel and the children of Samaria. Father, even the church today, they were going to worship in Jerusalem. But Father, they're never going to worship in Samaria. They're not going to worship in Jerusalem proper. But Father God, they're going to worship you, Father. Not on that mountain, not on the mountain of Samaria, not on the mountain of Jerusalem, but on your mountain because your word, Father, your son, Father, you have become a great and mighty mountain that all the children of God need to go to, dwell in, believe in, and be blessed in. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. In your name we receive this blessing, Father. Amen. 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 Go ahead and sing hymn number 528. <clears throat> Song the end and early Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Hallelujah. See on the Oh,
time in the service, Father, where we show, Father, just a little bit of our love, Father, that you've given us. Father, you bless us with, Father. And Father, this past week we ask, give you thanks for blessing the healings, Father, of two of our members, Father. And they will come back in full recovery, Father, through Amen. your word, Father. And Father, as we prepare our hearts to give this morning, Father, let us remember all this comes from your hand, Father. And Father, we just want to give back just a small portion to you, Father, as you have told us. And Father, we just love this precious word, Father, that you have given us, Father. Father, we come here today, Father, to lift you up and to praise you, Father, and to glorify you, Father. And Father, for all this, we just say, thank you for this precious word, Father. And we love you. In your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 present these offerings to you, Father. We pray that you will find, find them favorable, Father God. Let it be a sweet aroma to you, Father God. And Father, as we go forward in this church, Father, we ask that you will guide us and direct us, Father, in your word and the direction you would have us go, Father. For everything we do, Father, is to glorify you, Father, not us. And Father, we just lift you up and glorify you again today, Father, all that you've given us in this church, Father. In your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name. As far as the welcoming, I have one person I'd like to welcome today, and that's my granddaughter, Hannah. Amen. Stand up, please. Anybody visiting from Kansas? Um, announcements? Okay, I would like our, fo our church to focus on the purchase and distribution of the senior pastor's redemptive history books. Please do your part in help to share these books with your friends, neighbors, and loved ones. I know Pastor Brady didn't want us to mention this, but through his love, uh, him and his wife donated 10 of each of the five books in our church. So we need to not leave them on the shelf. We need to get them out there into the hands of those that can truly use them, Father. Father will bless us for that. Uh, Barrett Seminary will be seeking formal accreditation from tracks. Uh, I think the pastor may talk more on that, so I'm not going to go into great detail. But basically, um, we're trying to be accredited here so we can teach a, a seminary here and uh, actually get an accredited degree. Pastor. Yeah, very briefly on those announcements, I don't, don't want to offend you or insult you by trying to expound on them too much, but I. Uh, what Pastor Beatty has done here, he's come to be with us at the seminary and uh, assist me here at the church. And uh, we never know what God is going to do in us and through us, but I believe God's going to do great things through him and his wife, and I want you to welcome them to this church. Amen. Welcome them to the school. And you're going to begin to see great things happening out back. New buildings added, perhaps a new sanctuary. Many things are going to begin to happen in our church. But you know what? 
It doesn't matter how great a thing that Pastor Beatty brings with them. It doesn't matter how great of what I try to do. What I want to see happen is many exciting things beginning to happen in you. Amen. 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 That's what I want. I, want to just, I really want to commend every one of you to be in Bible study this afternoon. You know, Dad, Bernie, I want to ask you something. If you had to die today, could you be go with joy? Could you go in peace? Would you be happy about that? Could you be excited about it? You know what? God doesn't want us to die, but if he calls us home, we got to go. Amen? Amen. Some of you old people out there, you swear, well, I swear, I, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of death. I'm, I'm not worried about you. You're lying. If you don't have real faith, if you're not really worshiping God in spirit and in truth, you're on the wrong mountain. It don't matter what building you're in or what church you're in, you're in the wrong place. You need to change mountains, change churches, change word, change your heart. Because if you change all those things, God's going to change you. Amen? You better let me listen to me. Don't be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of God. You don't have to be afraid of God. You don't have to be afraid of judgment. That's what I'm trying to pastor and lead this church to. You'll have comfort even if you had to go. When Father calls you, you've got to go. But if Father says stay here, he don't want you just to stay here and go fishing. He don't want you to stay here going to the beach. Though you can do that sometimes, just don't miss church when you're doing it. Amen? Put God's house first. You think God's stupid? Would you hire somebody that would, would miss work to go to the beach? Would you critically need him to do something for you? God knows what kind of a worker you are in his church and in his field. Work for God. Amen? Amen. Don't be afraid of anything. I don't know about you. Whatever my state is, whatever my departure is, whatever my way is, if I'm here until he transfigures me, if I'm here and me and Pastor Beatty are hugging necks until the end, it don't matter. I'll, I know, I have joy in my heart right now because I know what my end is. And I want you to know what your real end is. Right now everybody says, I'm gonna, I've got a mansion in heaven. You don't know anything. You're living in the wrong world and heaven to you is light years away. Be in Bible study this afternoon, you might get shot. Amen? Let's stand and let's sing hymn number six. Let's get excited.